Hi, podcast listeners. Thanks so much for coming to visit my eco-friendly home today. I'm your host, Madison Hopkins, and I'm so delighted to have you. When you're a guest in my eco-friendly home, I want you to walk away with tangible steps to reduce your home's emissions, live healthier, cleaner, save money, and of course, build community. So come on in and make yourself right at home. Oh, goody, you brought those low sugar cookies I love. My favorite. Hi, podcast listeners, and welcome to today's episode. Here with me, I have Trish Becker. Trish is the co-founder of Story Spring Consulting and the director of community engagement at the University of Denver's Graduate School of Social Work. So Trish is here today to talk with me about co-housing. And for those of you who are familiar with co-housing, excellent. We would love to hear your feedback after the episode. And then for those of you who are not familiar with co-housing, hopefully by the end of this episode, we will have answered all of your questions. So just to give you all a little bit more insight about Trish, she is a founding member of Denver's newest co-housing community called Aria Co-Housing. And that's A-R-I-A, yes, like the character in Game of Thrones. (laughs) And she is a passionate advocate for housing solutions that address both the crisis of affordability, which is really real, and the global loneliness epidemic, which we can all relate to now that it's 2021. She's in the process of establishing a micro village in Wheat Ridge, Colorado that addresses both of those. And I'm so excited to hear what a inner city micro village for co-housing is gonna look and sound like. She holds a master's of social work from the University of Washington, a bachelor of science in psychology from Colorado State University. And the last thing I'm gonna say before I let Trish take the mic is I watched a TED Talk video that she gave for TED Talk Cherry Creek, wasn't it Cherry Creek? Yep. Perfect. And that link will be at the top of the bio since that's what I've missed or mentioned first. So Trish, passing off the mic to you now that we all know who you are, what you do, give us a really good insight about your mindset as well. And yeah, let's, let's explore who you are. Well, thanks so much for having me, Madison. I'm really excited to explore co-housing and especially to highlight it from a sustainability lens. I often um, talk about co-housing from the lens of belonging and human connection and meaning and sustainability is also such a a huge part of why people um, decide to live together in this way. So my journey started kind of from the, the bottom, if you look at it from a loneliness perspective. So I lived in a variety of communities for most of my life, just in various, you know, no one ever called it co-housing. It was like a group of roommates or a group of people working together and living communally abroad and that sort of thing. And then when I moved back to Denver, which is where I grew up, my partner and I found ourselves in the suburbs and frankly, hating it. We bought this house that was, you know, we, it was something that was big enough for our family to grow into and it was beautiful and we loved it. And then we lived there for two years and all of a sudden thought, we don't know any of our neighbors. We feel lonely, isolated. We have this house full of stuff that we don't use. We have rooms that sit vacant. It just didn't align with our values. So we started searching for different ways to live. And co-housing was a model that I was familiar with, but for some reason just thought that it was kind of out of touch for me. I just thought that it was something you know, that I couldn't afford, or it was for a different type of person than I was or something. It just felt kind of like something I would do one day. But then we discovered this group of people forming Aria Co-Housing on the Northwest side of Denver, and they had availability. And so we jumped. And so we ended up signing the contract to join this community, which hadn't even been completed yet, like on the same week that we found out that we were pregnant. So it was like this big, like none of our family understood how we could be growing in family, but then downsizing and choosing this different way of living. It didn't make sense to them, but it made total sense for us just to have a more connected and supported lifestyle when we were going to bring life into the world. Okay. I have so many questions already. (laughs) So it sounded like the house that you had, the one that was just really too big for you. When you were saying that, I got the sensation of it just feeling like really cold. 
because of the so much space and like not a lot of body heat. Yeah, that the word cold it fits so well because it was just my partner and I, and then it was just like it lacked the warmth of just life and meaning too. It just felt like it was just this place that we existed and it wasn't like we were friends with all of our neighbors and it was this gathering place. It just felt cold and vacant and kind of meaningless. Yeah. And then my second question, oh gosh, was it, I wanted to ask, what did that look like for you? But I think I was talking when you were talking about like maybe the money aspect about it, like what you didn't feel like you could afford it. And I was wondering what that looked like for you. And then also the difference in your mind of what co-housing you thought would look like versus like the just bunch of roommates that you were living with. Yeah. Yeah. So the first question about affordability, we, I knew that co-housing you know, if you look at a unit, a, like a unit in co-housing, whether it's a house, a condo, whatever, it's going to be slightly more expensive than that unit outside of a co-housing community would be in that particular market. And so I think that it took this reframing of like, well, what is the return on our investment? We're not just investing in real estate. We're not just paying for two bedrooms, two bathrooms, like we're also getting so much and so much of it is intangible and inquantifiable, but it's, you know, it's childcare. It's the feeling of coming home after a long day of work and having someone ask you how your day was and how that big presentation went. And it's the feeling of walking down the hallway in socks to borrow a cup of sugar and ending up staying for a glass of wine. Like it's all of that stuff that you can't, stack up against all of the features of a home that you just have to get your mind around. And so you have to be able to translate that to make it worth the extra money. The other question that you ask, I think that there is a view of co-housing and it's, it's somewhat accurate, right? Like the, the demographics do include more older folks than younger folks. And yet that's changing. And so I did have this impression of like, co-housing will be great for when I retire. It'll just be something for later when we want to downsize after our kids out of the house, that sort of thing. And so that took a reframing too. And I started to see younger people who are interested in it and living in co-housing. And now that we've kind of entered that world, the more I talk about describing what co-housing is, just about everyone in my peer group says like, oh, that's my dream. That's exactly what I want. I want to create a way to live with my friends and to share childcare and to cook for each other and and hang out together. So I do think that that's shifting. And that's something that I'm excited about being part of the conversation is how can communities be more accessible to younger folks and folks with kids? How can they be more accessible and attractive? I've actually met a lot of friends who also share that same vision. And I'm I'm talking with a group of people right now. I had a friend when I lived in Florida and she went before she moved away. She said, oh, I'm sure we'll live in the same like community one day. (laughs) And I knew what she meant. And, and it doesn't really fit into what I think you and I are about to explore. It's definitely more like almost like a thatch hut kind of vibe. Like we all till the soil and we all like make our own skirts. And just like very, what was it? What was the word? Um, Homo erectus, like form of human. (laughs) Like very much like superhumans, really, really good at working with the land. And I actually just saw a video, total side note yesterday on YouTube. It was about, it was called like living primitive or something like that. And she built a whole house out of just bamboo. But from where I can see that you are sitting, it looks like you have a built-in bookshelf and you know a regular wooden door. So it sounds like the actuality of a co-housing that currently exists might be like a lot more modern than what I have imagined before. Yeah, I think that there's a couple things there. It's important to note that there's this whole spectrum of intentional community is a good umbrella term. Co-housing is one model of that. And on one end is kind of what you're talking about. There's eco-villages, there are communes, there are places where, you know, there's more sharing of resources. Maybe there aren't 
privately owned homes, maybe it's all collectively owned, you know, there's, there are all these spectrums within intentional communities as far as like governance and financing and rural versus urban and all of that. So all of that's there when you talk about like living communally. Co-housing is on this end of communal living and it includes privately owned homes. They're usually really pretty. I've toured the most gorgeous communities and, you know, they're often designed with sustainability in mind. They're a little bit smaller than a traditional home because you can access the shared like guest house that you can rent out so that you don't have a guest room that sits empty 98% of the year. Instead, you have a shared guest suite that's really nice and that you can kind of check out. Or maybe you don't have a kitchen that's big enough to host a party, but you can host a party in the community kitchen, but you just have a kitchen of to yourself. So I think that there's a lot of misconceptions about maybe how much you would sacrifice to live in co-housing. So when we gave people tours of our condo in Aria, all of our friends would say, I got to be honest, like I kind of expected a dorm room. <laughs> you know, <laughs> And it's not, these are regular homes, slightly smaller, but we still value aesthetics and comfort. You know, they have their own in co-housing, at least they have their own bathrooms, kitchens, dining rooms, you know, the full, the full thing. We just share a little bit more. <laughs> it definitely sounds like a, a mix of a dorm room and and like a current apartment because I think dorm comes to mind. It's the only experience that most Americans at least have had where we live around a bunch of people that are like a hallway away. And in an apartment, it's a little bit different still because, you know, I think we're like, okay, I'm not in a dorm anymore. Like I, I can't really be friends with my neighbors down the hall. And then you don't really share that much either. I did just move out of a studio apartment with 16 units in the building. And I made some really good friends in that building. And COVID really brought that out from all of us because we were like, okay, well, we can't go anywhere. I guess we have to finally meet our neighbors. <laughs> I know a lot of people experienced that this year. And then the way you're saying like have on, having a large group of people come over and using the community kitchen, I instantly just think of like a modern day apartment that has all the extra amenities that, you know, maybe someone rents out for like a football game or, or things like that. Like the times when you would just generally need a larger kitchen. Yeah, that's exactly right. If you walked into a co-housing a condo in a co-housing community or a, a standalone home, you honestly probably wouldn't know. You could tour the whole thing and not think that it's any different, maybe a, a slightly less square footage, but you really don't sacrifice a lot and you gain so much. Your dorm comparison, I like fight against it when you think yeah. about the physical, like what it looks like. But as far as the community of it, I love it. It does. It feels like it feels like the dorms, although with more ability to, I don't know, when I think of the dorms, I think of like open doors and people in and out all the time and even too much togetherness. So co-housing, you still have the ability to shut your door. You know, you can opt in or out of activities. If you don't want to go to the weekly meal that week, that's fine. But if you do want to go have someone cook you a meal, just show up to eat and you can hang out with people, you can do that. So it has that kind of ease and that comfort that you get with being so close to people that it's not like you know just getting to know someone so I, I read a statistic that 66 percent of people say that they barely know their neighbors that they consider them strangers and to me that is just so strange and sad that we we do we live on these blocks and we don't know the people that live right next to us like the people that we could call on when we need help but then something comes up and we don't even know their names so co-housing creates this space where you just you just see each other at meals or the happy hour or passing in the hallways or in the common room or out of the playground or whatever and so you just develop this this easy relationship with them where you don't have to introduce yourself or say, what do you do for a living? You just know each other. And so you can meet each other's needs more easily as well. So I wanted, to, here's another thing that you said, you're saying sustainable, co-housing is more sustainable. They're generally built that way. And I want to ask you about the mindset. Like why, why do you think that is? 
Yeah. So like people who enter into co-housing typically, typically have some shared values around, you know, community, connection, sustainability. So that's going to go into the design. Oftentimes that's not across the board, but there's two elements that I think really connect communal living to work in in sustainability. And one of those is the sharing of space and resources. So it's just this like, do I really need this much space or can I have a little less myself and share it so that you don't have, you know, these just like empty lawns and garages that are so wasted when they're not used. So instead we can say, let's all share this space instead of wasting all of the energy to keep it up and heat it. And just like the physical space when we're in a housing crisis, especially in Denver. So you can more, you can activate that space more. And there's like one of the sayings in co-housing is, does everyone need their own lawnmower? And there are so many things that you could unpack. You could walk through your house and say like, how often do I use this we pulled out a wheatgrass juicer for the first time in like three years yesterday. It's like, could we share this? You know, if we use it once <laughs> once every three years, even if we just use it once a week, could we keep it somewhere else? And so it is just generating less waste. We're borrowing less, we're throwing away less, we're sharing more. And then the other piece is that I just believe that when you fill your life with connection and meaning, you don't have these gaps that you want to fill with consumption and production. And we know that consumption leads to waste. And so I just think that it's not reducing our impact on the planet is not as much about looking at what we can come back, but cut back, but rather looking at what we can fill our lives with to pull us away from those habits that are harmful to ourselves and the planet. Mm. That's a, that's a whole box right there. Isn't it? <laughs> that's where the real psychology major comes in. <laughs> the psychology degree. Yeah. 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 I mean, okay. So another thing that I, I jotted down was you're saying you get a lot. Okay. So this actually ties in with what you were just saying. The psychological aspects about things like you're not having to fill your life with things you don't need because you have that community. And Earlier, you said those are sort of the unquantifiable moments that you get from having a little bit more expensive of what I'm assuming is a mortgage payment, which I also want to talk about. And when we spoke in our intro call, you mentioned that that comes in with the HOAs. So you you pay more for your HOA. And so it's not so much that like your particular unit costs more, but that like the HOAs cost more. Is that correct? Yeah, so it really depends on the financing structure of of the community. So there are co-ops, which are completely different than this, but at least in my co-housing community and and others that I've seen, the unit, it, it is slightly more because you also have access to this like common house with a hot tub on the roof and a yoga studio in the basement and you know the the playground that's just for your community and you know you have access to all these physical things so that is more the HOA is part of it too so that's how many co-housing communities are governed is that we pay this HOA fee and that goes into the maintenance of all these common spaces it just creates a budget for us to do things that that build community so we'll have a budget for physical improvements, for social activities, for marketing and networking, you know, to go to conferences, all the things that create a rich community. That's all what the HOA goes towards. Did that answer your question? Yeah. And I didn't know y'all had a hot tub and a yoga room. (laughs) To be fair, my community does not have that, but but many do. And even in the area, there are some communities with amazing amenities. Well, yeah, what are some co-housing communities in the Denver area? So we know that you helped co-found ARIA and where are you living now? And you're also helping start and f- co- co-found, am I saying that right? The one, the micro community in Wheat Ridge. So what's that called? Where are you living now? Sure. And what are the other names of co-housing communities? 
Um, yeah, so Aria Co-Housing is the one that we joined, loved, still are members of, but are transitioning out of simply because our family is growing. So we had a child, which was fine, but then our family's growing in the other direction too. So we needed to create space for two generations of women above me. So we just simply needed a larger space, which led us to where I live now, which is, it's in, it's in Wheat Ridge, right about 38th and Sheridan for those that are local. And it is an acre with two houses, but plenty of space to grow. And so our vision is twofold. So number one is to build more dwellings on here. So hopefully have three to five families living here and then convert. There's just a ton of outbuildings. So I really believe in using the built environment instead of just building new things. There's all these garages, for example. So we converted one into a common house. And the vision is that it would not only be kind of a little micro village with the folks who live on the land, but also that common house would be available to everyone on the block. So we have a, a great sense of community on our street. And we, once, once we're able to gather, plan to have weekly meals and a tool library and skill sharing and a co-working space and all of that. But it wouldn't just be limited to who lives here. It would be expanded to the broader community. And that sort of embedded community is what's really exciting to me when I think about like the future of co-housing. And to answer the other part of your question, the other communities that are in the area, I, I'm reluctant to name them because I know that I'll forget a couple, but Hearthstone is one in the Highlands. Harmony Village is one. Highline Crossing is in Littleton. Aria, of course. I'm sure I'm missing some, but... Which one has the hot tub? <laughs> that one, I don't think Hearthstone has one, but Wild Sage is one in Boulder, and it is like gold standard. You know it. <laughs> of course it's in Boulder. <laughs> All the Boulder people are going to hit unsubscribe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's perfect. It's a, it's a <laughs> <idea up there. laughs> Don't worry, people. I lived in Boulder. I gave it a shot. It wasn't for me. I'm so sorry. Yeah, that's really cool. There's one in the Highlands. That's so interesting. And I will link all these in the show notes. And this is going to be really fun for me to explore after as well. And yeah, so like, like talk to me because I want to, I, I think I want to get into a co-housing community. So like, how would I do that? And I was actually just texting somebody today, like the current apartment that I live in doesn't have recycling, doesn't have composting, which is standard to not have composting. I just talked to Denver Gov, which they're, Denver Gov is like the best. They're so easy. They're so friendly. They're so easily accessible and they give a lot of really good resources. I'm actually trying to get them on the podcast, but yeah, like they only compost if it's a, a unit of six dwellings or less. So it's mostly single family homes and some like quadplexes. And then they do recycling for the same amount as well, but they have a community place where I'm going to start bringing it, which is in Cherry Creek. But I was just thinking about like, what do I ultimately want? What's the living space that I ultimately want to live in? Because I don't want to live in a single family home. I just think that, I mean, for me, that's just a lot of upkeep. You know, I'm not that handy. I'm not a handy ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> and then like a condo I'm like yeah like okay I could kind of live in a condo but would it like enrich me in the ways that I want and so this this co-house and of course there's a bunch of other options of, of ways that I could live but yeah so like talk to me as though I want to get in <laughs> yeah okay a couple things if co-housing is the model that you want. I encourage people to check out coho.org, which is the National Co-Housing Association. They have a lot of great resources and they're doing virtual conferences and all that, but they also have a directory. And many times if there's openings in a co-housing community, they will be listed with that organization. The other thing that I recommend is just get to know the communities because the reality is there's oftentimes a pretty long wait list. People don't like to leave co-housing once they're in and they're not just like building new units. So many communities will say the first step is to like come hang out with us at dinner, 
you know, get to know us, decide whether we're, we like us and we like you, you know, and, and we vibe, and then you can be on a waiting list so that if something opens up, then we can reach out to you. I will say Aria Co-housing has a couple of units available now, which is just the nature of them being kind of a new community and having, you know, those working out those transitions. So that's rare and it's rare to have a couple of units in the same community together. So if you and a couple of your friends want to move into an existing community, that's available, which is exciting. The other thing that I think a lot about is that co-housing, because of the affordability piece, because of the long wait lists because of the nature that they're not everywhere and you'd have to pick up and move to a co-housing community or start your own, which that's another option. You can start your own community. There's a lot of great resources for that. Um, Co-housing association and also the foundation for intentional community is a great place to look if you want to start your own community. But I think that so many of us can take what we know about co-housing, take the principles of co-housing, and we can create that communal feel where we live. So I don't think that it's necessary for everyone to pack up and move into co-housing. I think that you can say, I'm really good friends with my neighbors, or I want to be, I wonder if we did a rotating meal where every week we went to a new person's house one day a week, or maybe you have a big garage that you want to say like, everyone bring your tools over here. We can have a simple checkout system and, you know, people, we can share more tools and that way we don't each have to have our own X, Y, Z. So I just think that if you can look at your life and like what you have an abundance of and think really creatively, you can really create these little villages without having to pack up and move. And the other piece that I'll say is there's an opportunity to advocate here. So in Denver, there's a lot of work being done about how many unrelated people are allowed to live together. And so that will open up so many possibilities as far as how people creatively live together. Another area of policy to look at is wherever wherever you live, what the policy on accessory dwelling units are. Because so often, like so many people have these backyards where you could build a tiny house, or you could convert that shed or garage into a a little house or an apartment that could be used as rental income. It could be for your family. I feel like you know this more than anyone, Madison, but I read a statistic that like half of real estate searches include the need for like extra space for parents or adult children or something. So I think that more and more we're looking for ways to live together creatively and how to like put more people in a space without sacrificing, you know, personal boundaries and all of that. So I think that if you want to live communally, it ranges from like build an ADU in your backyard or advocate for that to check out co-housing and figure out a community that you want to move into. My, one of my buyers right now, she's actually looking for a house and fingers crossed hands together that we our offer gets accepted on it, but she really wants to build an ADU in the back. And when I tell my parents, they're like, why, why would someone want to like build, why would they want to live in the garage? I'm like, it's just, it's just an option. I mean, it's not going to be the garage. It's really just an extra small building. And, but from a real estate perspective, like when you're looking for a home to buy, there is no button for ADU garage ADU. You have the buttons for garage attached and detached. And if I'm not mistaken, there's also fin. No, I don't think there's finished and unfinished. I could be wrong, but I, those buttons, I don't really trust them anyways, because it, it, you're, you're entrusting your search by hitting garage attached. You're limiting your search to properties that have that button clicked. So you're trusting another real estate agent to say, yes, this is an attached garage and like have it be legitimately attached or detached or whatever. And then there's also, there's not a button to specify that there's an office space, which hopefully the MLS system is working on that soon. And so a lot of times you'll see like a four bedroom house, two bath, and then you notice one of the bedrooms is honestly an office space it's right off the kitchen it's pretty small and so I really think there 
there's a couple features that really need to be updated in order to help people find that home that they want to live in a lot better. And there's also a very limited amount, since I'm talking about it, there's also a very limited amount of like buttons you can click that have green features mm -hmm. or what green certification that they abide by or things like that. And then again, for me, it goes back to, okay, well, I'm entrusting somebody else who maybe doesn't really know about green features to classify it correctly. Totally. I feel like those are both such great, like tangible ways to change the conversation around sustainability and housing density, right? Like most people don't even know what an ADU is. So accessory so dwelling unit. <laughs> For all of you listening, it's an accessory dwelling unit, sometimes called an auxiliary dwelling unit. And it's essentially a small unit in the back of your yard, exactly like Trish and I just said, that you convert into a living quarter instead of a place to park your car. And does that include basements as well? Would it like an unfinished, could you turn a basement into an ADU if you like put a bathroom in a kitchen? You know, I think it has to be detached. I could be very wrong about that, but from my understanding, it is a, a detached unit from the house because then you would just have a finished basement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, thanks for defining that. And so you're saying like you're trusting people, the, the other agent or homeowners to know what that is, check the button when the reality is, if, if we don't even know what an ADU is, then we're not looking at our bathroom and thinking, oh, or our bathroom, our backyard and thinking, oh, I could build a new ADU, convert that shed, you know, do these creative things. And so the more that we talk about that and include that in a home search, maybe the more likely people are. And I just think so often about, you know, the housing crisis in Denver, it's just astronomical. The home prices here it's just unreal and so when people are living without homes and you know in substandard housing and then there's like these backyards and these empty garages it just is like you know like can we convert some of this extra unused space into homes and and solve a couple of problems and I think it starts with little things like you know changing the features on a home search website <laughs> Yeah, I should write the MLS about that because it's kind of necessary. And what you were saying about like your advice that you give to someone who might want to live in a co-housing, you're like, okay, well, actually, and I, I love this because it's taking like the big macro change and you're saying like, whoa, 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 pump the brakes, like look around you first and see what you can do to shift that instead. And one of my mentors and team leader for Latitude Real Estate, Alyssa Collins, she and and her husband, Neil, Neil was my podcast episode number three. I feel like we could all talk about this all day, but they, when COVID started, or was it before COVID? Well, they started just, you know, meeting their neighbors, like Alyssa will bring them seeds that they can plant and they started their own garden in their front yard and neighbors come by and they're like, oh my gosh, I love your garden. And then she meets her neighbors like that. And Neil, and he said this in the episode three was walking in like just on a walk one day and he passed an alley and he saw, and I think it was at the beginning of COVID, like a couple of households brought big tables out and they were, they were physically distanced, but they were still having a meal with each other. And so that, that's a lovely story. And I feel like you really tapped into that too, by saying, you know, like have, have a dinner once a week with the people who you already live around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm so glad you bring that up because that has been one of the more inspiring things that I've seen over the past year and actually is an area of research that I'm working on with the university is around how we have come together and created mutual aid networks and collective care structures just to help each other out and how being so desperate to be with other humans we got really creative like you know and our our neighborhood did the same we had outdoor movies in our yard you know distance masks and it was just such a cool way to come together and I think spoke to how badly we need it because we're like, okay, we'll figure it out. Like we'll do it distance. Like I walk with my friends now. That was never a thing that I did with friends before just go on walks. And that's something that I do now all the time because we're just saying we need each other. So let's figure out how to do it safely. 
And I think that we have a new appreciation for how badly we need one another too, as a result of this, like it was taken away from us. And so, you know, we feel those impacts on our mental health. There's a prediction that there will be a social recession because we know that loneliness doesn't just affect our mental health, it increases rates of depression and anxiety, but it also increases our risk of heart disease, dementia, you know, it's really taking a toll on our bodies. And so we're likely to see those health outcomes for a long time because of this time that we've been away from each other. So all of that to say, I think that there's a lot to be learned from the pandemic and a lot of areas that I hope we don't just go back to the way it was done before, but rather use it as an opportunity to rebuild some ways of living. Yeah, and I love the work from what it sounds like what you're doing with building your own community in Wheat Ridge, your little plot in Wheat Ridge. So that's really cool that you you get to structure it how you want. Yeah, it's so fun to have just all that possibility before us. And I'm learning so much about city planning boards and architecture and a survey, just things that I never, ever knew anything about. And it's been really fun and just a fun way to engage with the land here too. So the thing that we love about it, in addition to just like having possibility to grow into a community is the, the trees. And so just like developing a relationship with the space here and then thinking of ways that we can share it and build towards more collective structures here is, is really a fun process. Well, Trish, I also have like some hard money questions for you around co-housing and the answer might be, well, it just depends on how you structure it. It, The answer probably is, it just depends on how you structure it. But I'm curious about like how you take title in a co-housing development and like how you gain equity in your in your purchase and and those sorts of things like do people ever rent with the right to buy what what is what is the deal with all that how does that work yeah so again really this answer is specific to co-housing it would not apply to like a housing co-op or something else which have very different funding structures but co-housing is just like owning a house in a regular neighborhood or an apartment in a apartment building so they're they're privately owned homes, you know, you could walk into a co-housing community and it would look maybe a little bit different just because like architecturally the homes are designed the same and maybe there's not a street that connects it. There's more of a sidewalk that connects all the homes, but otherwise that's your home. Like this is my, my structure. It's, it's exactly the same. And Aria co-housing is the community that I came from and it's condos. So it's just, I, I own own the condo and I'm selling the condo. Rental completely depends on the community. So many communities have a structure where rentals exist. I believe that co-housing as a movement needs to open up to the idea of rental just because I think that it invites diversity and accessibility. But of course, there's there's a conversation around investment because you're not just investing your money in your home, but you're also investing your time, you're attending meetings, you're making decisions. So, you know, that just invites conversations around renting versus buying. But most communities do have a structure where rentals can exist. Okay. So your question? Yes. And do people ever buy, and again, this is specific to co-housing, do people ever buy a unit with friends taking title, like with friends? Is that something, or like, or could you buy, could I buy a unit that has, is there like a general number of bedrooms that they have? Could I buy a three bedroom unit and rent it out to my friends? Is that something that's allowed? Those are great questions. So yeah, the question around, could you buy and then rent out to a friend that generally, yes, it just depends on the community. Sometimes, you know, like my community allows a certain number of units at a time to be rented so that it's not all filled with rentals and you can only rent for a certain amount of years before they ask you to sell. So they basically don't want it to turn into a regular rental property with rotating people. But if it's your home, like I could have easily rented out a bedroom to a friend in my home. So it just depends on the community, but most are are pretty flexible around that. The question of buying is a great one. There's a a 
lot of really cool work being done in Denver around co-buying by Sarah Wells as a real estate agent and vocal advocate in the space of co-buying. And so I think more and more lenders are becoming creative, not just within co-housing, but with saying like, okay, there's these two families and they want to buy a really cool house that they could never afford on their own. Let's figure out structures for them to work together and, and purchase a single family home together or purchase a unit. One other example, Wild Sage and Boulder, I know has all of their houses. So each house is individually owned except for one and the community owns that home and it's run as a co-op. So it's rented, each of the rooms in that house are rented, but then the community is building equity because they own the home. Hmm. Okay, interesting. So the co-op dynamic, and and this is something I need to be more well-versed in from the real estate service perspective, but so the co-op versus a co-house, can you elaborate on that? I'll do my best. I'm familiar with co-ops, but basically a co-op is a collectively owned, so maybe um, there's a home that's collectively owned, it's owned by an entity, and then you become a member of the co-op, and then you get a share of the house. So maybe you're like assigned a room, but the ones that are limited equity co-ops do allow, it's not renting, like you are building equity. So when you exit the co-op, you, you get that equity that you earned from your time living in that house. And I can provide a lot of great referrals for people who know a lot more about co-ops than I do. Yeah, I would love to talk with them about co-ops and and just learn more about the different ways that people creatively live. So just to make sure I'm understanding from a high level perspective, co-ops, the entity owns and in co-housing, the individuals. Yeah. Okay, very cool. Yeah. Do you have any like topics we want to explore about the sustainable side of the co-housing? Hmm. I'm, I don't know if there's anything in addition to what I mentioned. I can certainly talk more about space sharing or resource sharing, that sort of thing. I, I guess the only thing that I'll add is, you know, you mentioned in your apartment building, you're just trying to get them to compost. You know, this is like something I hear from a lot of friends that are like, we don't have recycling in my building. And so I think that co-housing provides this opportunity to introduce a lot of behaviors that will promote sustainability and reduce waste. So like we had someone get really passionate about how we wash the dishes. And so she just like brought it to a meeting and was like, can we have some sort of gray water system here? Here's how it would work. Like I got the buckets. Can we, can we all just like opt into doing this? And so there's tons of things like that, or, you know, we set up a partnership with a local compost service that comes and picks up our compost every week, or we, we partnered with a local farm on their CSAs, like all of those sort of things you can just, you can do when you're in numbers, when you have a community, you can go to an organization and say like, hey, we'll have 25 people sign on to your CSA. <laughs> like, can we get a group rate? That kind of thing. And it's just easier than in a traditional apartment building where you don't know people. They might look at you like, yeah, no, I don't, I don't care that you're excited about composting. We're not going to do it that's not what you're going to be met with in community. You're going to be met with people who say, yes, thank you for bringing that to us. Like we believe in caring for our planet. So thanks for the idea and let's figure out how to make it happen. I think additionally with apartments, it it is hard because you have to go through your property managers, the apartment managers, and everyone knows that that's, (laughs) you got to really put on your boots to go talk to them about something. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Yeah, it can be intimidating to bring ideas sometimes to a big group. You know, you feel like you're going out on a limb to to propose something to the community, but but most of the time communities have structures to have these conversations. So they have a way to propose something and then you discuss it and you figure out whether it's the right thing. So it's not just you going up to one person and hoping they're in a good mood that day. <laughs> so yes to your idea. I actually had this really interesting visualization when you said going out on a limb. I, I just imagined because I actually just mentioned something earlier to one of my roommates and I mentioned something last week to one of my other roommates and they're both, I mean, they're brother and sister. So like they come from the same family, but they're both super chill. And they were just like, yeah, like, okay. Like we, yes, Madison, we hear you. Like we respect you. 
and like whatever you say to us like we're not going to get offended and I was just like oh like sigh of relief because you just never know but I had this really cool visualization when you said that but like I'm a squirrel and I'm going out on this limb and then I turn around and see how far away I am from the tree and you know in movies when they do like that tunnel vision perspective where something's close and just goes like and then really far away and then when you actually get the community response and they're like yeah whatever you like that tunnel vision goes away and you realize like you're only five feet away from the actual stump of the tree where you thought you were 10. That is such a great metaphor Madison not just for the conversation around sustainability but for like what it feels like to be in community because when you're alone of course you feel that way you're out on a limb by yourself you don't know if anyone's there to catch you but when you turn back behind you and you see like this community that knows and loves you and is like hell yeah like thanks for the idea about the gray water or whatever like we support you we're here for you that is what co-housing is all about I love that squirrel metaphor (laughs) (laughs) so I'm a squirrel (laughs) it reminds me of something else too that I had this great conversation with one of the co-directors of the foundation for intentional community and she was talking about you know, right now we're navigating all of these, as a society, we're navigating these awkward conversations about like masks and boundaries and, you know, all of this stuff. And she was just saying in the intentional community world, these conversations are still happening. It's not like everyone's on the same page about these things, but we are just better equipped to have them. So like, we know how to have conflict and how to say like, we're on total opposite ends. We're going to bring it it might feel awkward or tense, but we have these like agreements and these processes and a community that surrounds us and supports us with these. So we're just able to navigate this um, more easily. I learned a really beautiful word earlier that really embodies that, but I totally forgot what it was. Oh, I was so excited. I know. I'm so sorry. (laughs) I'll have to ask again, like, Hey, what was that word that you used? But yeah, it was, it was essentially like being able to have conversations, even though we don't agree, Um, which is when I, I feel like I struggle with that. Like it can be very scary, but just to not go too far off topic, because I could definitely get into that. So Trish, I have some links already from you for your Ted talks, which I said that I would link. I have your LinkedIn, your Instagram, which I will share with everyone. And of course, the co-housing community websites. And you mentioned earlier, you said, oh, if someone wants to start their own co-housing, these are two great resources for them. What did you say they were? Yeah, so the one is the co-housing association and that's coho.org. I mentioned that one about the directories as well, but they're doing a lot of virtual gatherings around how how to start communities. They're specific to co-housing. There's also the Foundation for Intentional Community, and their website is just ic.org, just letter i, letter c.org, and they actually just launched an online course called How to Start an Intentional Community, so it's everything from like, how do you get land, how do you buy it, how do you figure out financing, all of that for everyone out there that's like, I I just want to buy a piece of land with my friends and, you know, all the dreamers out there, I think that would be a really good place to start Oh, perfect. I will absolutely send that and this episode to a number of people just came to mind about that. Yeah, one of my friends, Dara, and some of her cohorts, we were actually talking about exactly that, how to buy land. So I got to sneak a couple questions into the podcast specifically about that, like in buying, buying with friends and the hard money question. So that, that specifically came from that conversation outside of the podcast. But is there anything that you want to leave the listeners with or leave me with or? Yeah, I mean, I think I always say like the model of co-housing is for some and it's not for others. Like some people hear it and think that sounds so cool. And others like have this physical reaction that that's not for you. And so I would say just a reminder that co-housing is just one model. And I think that the future of of co-housing, just the future of life is one of us finding creative ways to live together. And so I just encourage everyone to be creative, to like think outside the box and just put your heads together with some other people. I'm actually starting to gather people 
who fit into this that are just like, I don't know, I just don't want to live alone in the suburbs. So I want to meet other people, share resources, connect with others. And all that info can be found, I don't know, on my website and Instagram. But yeah, just like continue to be creative and think outside the box, whether it's co-buying or changing a barn into a house. Like we can do this. We can figure out better ways to live together and to have more meaningful lives. And it doesn't all have to look like the models that have already been created for us. My real estate teams, our latitude conversation this morning, one of our members said, well, it's a struggle for millennials to buy a home right now. And, and some feedback was, well, it's a struggle for everyone to buy real estate right now. So as we were talking, the housing crisis, the affordability crisis, um, especially in Denver. But he said, well, if Gen Z is going to want to buy a house, they're going to have to get really creative. So ties perfectly in with what you just said that like, these are just creative ways to, to find a way to live how you want to live and everyone wants to like live how that how we want to live i want to live how i want to live and i want to find people that fit that as well and everyone has their own like version of that so i think i think that's fantastic and i can't wait to share this with everyone i know (laughs) so thank you so much madison this was so fun it's just it's exciting to talk about this stuff and to see the future of communal living kind of taken off Well, thanks for being here today, Trish. I really appreciate your insight and for teaching us about co-housing. Podcast listeners, as always, thanks for being a guest in my eco-friendly home today. I really hope you learned something new and I hope you find a way to implement this into your life so you too can create your eco-friendly home. As always, I'm available to direct message on Instagram at Moving with Madison. And besides my podcast, I provide services as a real estate change agent in the Denver metro area, specializing in helping you buy, sell, or create your eco-friendly home, something that this podcast is helping me get better at each and every day. When you come back over, please bring those cookies again. They were really good, and I'll see y'all next time.